Abi? Since we have a quiet moment from the spacewalkers and an expert here to answer it, uh, we're going to take some of the Ask NASA questions that have been coming in. Thanks for sending those in today. Okay, I see it. Thank you. This next one coming in from Molly, asking, what is the equipment on your backs? Yeah, the big uh, white blocks that you see on both of the uh, spacewalkers' backs, those are called the PLIS, the Portable Life Support Systems, and that is the uh, kind of the engine of the whole spacesuit. Uh, rather than thinking of the spacesuit as an outfit that you put on, think of it more as a very small aircraft or spacecraft that you're getting into. And so that's the engine of the spacecraft, and that provides everything that the human body needs to stay alive. Uh, as you mentioned before, the temperature can swing outside the space station, depending if you're in the sun or the shade, by about a total of about 400 degrees. Uh, and so uh, a big part of uh, that life support system is the cooling. It also provides, uh, it's where the battery is kept that provides all the electric power to the suit. Uh, things that require electric power are like your glove heaters, uh, lights, and, uh, and then it also provides uh, liquid cooling. So there's a sublimator there that actually uh, cools the uh, liquid that is in the suit, and this, the spacewalkers are wearing um, somewhat of a long john underneath the uh, suits, and very small tubes of water are passed through it. And so the, the pump in the water uh, originates in the backpack and moves through the spacewalker's body. Attached to the pliss on the back is what we call the SAFER, which is a simplified aid for EVA rescue. And it consists of, it's the safety element. So if the spacewalker were, were to come off of structure and without a tether, uh, it's basically a small jet pack that allows them to fly themselves back to station. We'll keep going with another question from Samantha Johnson, this time asking, how big is the space station? That's a firm, Jessica, clocking six. And the space station, when you look up at it from the Earth, it just looks like a little tiny dot up in the sky, but it's actually quite enormous. If you laid the space station over a American football field, it would be about the same size. So the uh, solar arrays uh, that uh, you kind of see sometimes in the background of these views would lay over the end zone, and they're about 50 meters wide. Uh, and the livable space of the space station are the round components that you see, and that's probably about 3,500 square feet inside. Copy. Double check wire tie tucked under the boot plate. It is tough. Stephanie, I can report the same clocking of six, black on black, good pull twist test, and I do see the, the wire tie. Copy, Jessica. Both uh, good checks for you both. For Jessica, the remainder of the settings, Romeo, Romeo, Fox 6. Romeo, Romeo, Fox 6. Copy. Good read back for Christina. The remainder of the settings, Yankee, Yankee, Delta 12. Work. Both spacewalkers right now are working on checking out uh, some worksite interfaces that are used, uh, for instance, to p install the foot restraints they use at the work sites. And so they are both uh, testing those out by putting the foot restraints they've been using in and just making sure that they are working as expected. So far, all looking good. And we are now at the five hour and 30 minute mark. That's how long today's spacewalk was scheduled to last, but things are going well. So the spacewalkers are going to keep working for a little while.
Great view here from Jessica Mears. Uh, helmet camera looking down at the Pacific Ocean. Space stations heading uh, northeast towards, it looks like they'll hit the coast of, around the border between the U.S. and Canada. So Anna, I feel like this is a pretty good view, but uh, how does it compare to the real thing? There is uh, no words and no pictures that can describe or prepare you for the moment that you look out uh, at the Earth and the outside of the space station uh, during an EVA. You know, these spacewalkers ha are, have, there's no, the only thing that separates them from the back vacuum of space is a very, uh, their visor right in front of their face, which just provides this amazing view. And uh, if there was a word for the opposite of claustrophobia, that's kind of how you feel. You know, it's just, it's, it's the most infinite uh, void that you can possibly imagine. And what's really interesting about it is that Earth uh, is actually the closest thing to you. So looking at Earth, you feel very close and connected to Earth. And the significant sensation for me, it's, of course, it's different for everybody. The sig significant sensation for me was when I looked away from Earth and you realize how much more there is to explore, how much uh, further we can go. And uh, it, it's just it really incredible to be kind of attached to Earth uh, by gravity, uh, holding onto the space station during these uh, EVAs. Copy, those are good settings. And Jessica, as you uh, continue to translate inboard, we'll also take that uh, brake check on the CETA carts for the uh, inboard brake pedals, depressing them two times. Christina, Jessica, PET is currently five hours, 30 minutes. Uh, what we were thinking, and we'd like to get your assessment, is that if we uh, were to uh, go after the TSAP task, we show that at about 40 minutes, and uh, we'd have Jessica work the MDM and perhaps some of the CP13. That would have us finishing up at about, uh, finishing those tasks at about six hours, 15 minutes, uh, with an uh, EVA duration of six hours, 40 minutes. And for me, that sounds like a good plan. That also sounds fine to me. And a good brake release on the port seat cart. Copy. Uh, do you both uh, like the plan? And copy, Jessica, good uh, brake release on the port seat cart. And Stephanie, I can confirm this ATFR is in Yankee, Yankee, Delta. Delta 12, I'm looking at the other side of the group plate. Copy that, Yankee Yankee Delta 12, thank you. With that, you can both uh, continue translating inboard. Jessica can stop at the MDM work site. Christina, the uh, medium ORU bag is stowed there. You can pick that up and bring that to the airlock as you retrieve uh, crew lock bag number three with the TSOP uh, hardware. Okay, and Jessica, I am at the starboard seat, but still, so good by one. I see you, and I'm pausing here. That call from Capcom, Stephanie Wilson, given the uh, spacewalkers a preview of what to expect. They are officially beyond the planned time for the spacewalk, but uh, good to keep going. Plan for now as long as a six hour and 40 minute spacewalk, which is about the, the normal time that most spacewalks last. Okay, 
So for the next task on their list, uh, Jessica Meir is going to be going back to that multiplexer, demultiplexer box where she uh, was headed to this morning, but got called away to catch up with Christine, Christina Cook on her way to uh, the P4 work site. Uh, going back to disconnect an Ethernet cable and get it tied down. And then Christina Cook is going to work on one of the get aheads for the uh, for the space station, uh, installing a primary trunnion slip off prevention on what uh, will eventually hold the Bartolomeo platform on the end of the Columbus module. Uh, that's going to be a platform for experiments on the outside of the space station that'll be launching uh, next year. And this is going to be a support mechanism that gives it a little bit of extra support on the uh, the trunnion, the place where they install it uh, before that platform does get installed. And Stephanie, say again where, oh, I've got the medium, are you back? It's this, yep, right in front of me. Copy. Christina, the GoPro is still hanging outside of it. Okay. Thank you. Once again, uh, we are past the planned uh, duration of the spacewalk, but uh, Capcom Stephanie Wilson called up to the crew a few moments ago that they have the go-ahead to keep working, and they agreed that they were okay with that. Uh, is that generally, you think, welcome news for crew members to get extra time outside? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, you know, it really depends on the tasks and how fatigued the crew are, uh, but uh, the crew, if they, if they felt like they wanted to go back inside, they definitely would have said it. Uh, these guys sound really excited to keep on going. Uh, I think they're having a lot of fun out there. Copy, Jessica. There is one caution. Avoid inadvertent contact with deployed TUS cable and passive UMAs. Copy. I remember reading that caution. I am glad that you remember it. Now that we're undoing the work. <laughs> Okay, and I am headed towards the sleeve to see this first. The medium are you back. Copy, Christina. Jessica, you can retrieve the uh, caps uh, from your trash bag. Okay, copy, I'm just going to get a BRT down here and then I'll get to work. Copy that. Stephanie, I have got the caps out of my trash bag. Do I have a go to demate the cable? The uh, is the label on the MDM MDM one six echo zero one zero five. A firm. Copy. You can demate whiskey zero zero eight seven P one from that MDM. Okay, copy in work. Stephanie, thermal cover is open. Copy, Christina, thermal cover open. View here of uh, Jessica Meir 
getting uh, to work on that Ethernet cable that she's disconnecting and then tying down. And you can also see here uh, the tether that the that she's got attached to her. Uh, it's it's maybe longer than you'd expect. I always think of it as just tied to the closest thing to them, but that doesn't look like what it is. Yeah, there's actually a couple different types of tethers that we use when we're outside of the space station. And the two that you see, this is a great shot of both of them. Uh, the one that goes directly to Jessica right now uh, is her 85-foot safety tether. And right below that tether, you can see where Christina's is. Uh, and those, I, I always call them kind of the retractable dog leash is what they, what they basically are. They, they're 85-foot tethers. We use two in a pack, so you can go out twice as far. And the, uh, the base of the tether is usually at the airlock, but because this crew had to go so far out, uh, they actually base their tethers at a different location from, than the airlock. And those tethers are always attached. And you'll hear them often talking about uh, their safety tethers and the positioning of it. Uh, it's really important to us that those don't get caught on anything. Uh, first of all, we don't want to ba break equipment, but most importantly, those are our primary safety lines uh, to the space station. Now, they do impart a little bit of a force on the spacewalkers, and so uh, when we get to a work site like Jessica is right now, we'll put down what's called a local tether, and that's about uh, three feet long, and it keeps us in the workplace uh, that we are right then. Uh, and so if Jessica was to, to let go of the space station uh, with no other tether attached, that, that that very long tether would actually slowly just pull her back to the anchor point. To understand the, uh, that sounds handy. Of your trash bag. Uh, and, and in that case, then we'd like you to try to capture that O-ring and place it in your trash bag. Okay, copy, in work. The medium over you bag is in the airlock, going for the head head crew left bag. Copy. And uh, Stephanie, I have the cap on the table side, so I'm going to use that vet to try to get that O-ring. Copy. And I got it. Got it on the vet. I will get that in my trash bag, and then I will go ahead and just tap, put the jack, uh, or put the plug on there. As a Copy. Nice work. You hear from Jessica Mears, helmet camera. She's been working to uh, disconnect and then tie down an Ethernet cable that's on a multiplexer, demultiplexer. She'll be working, uh, if time permits, with another Ethernet cable as well, getting one routed to a uh, video camera um, on the International Space Station's exterior. Meanwhile, Christina Cook has made her way to the airlock and is uh, now moving away from it, having switched out a tool bag. She'll be going over to the uh, Columbus module from here to install that uh, stanchion support. Copy. Stephanie, for EV-1, I've retrieved the crew outside from the airlock. Thermal cover is totally closed. Copy. After that, uh, check your safer handles down.
Christine, EV1, safety, safety handles are down. Copy, Christina. With that, you can translate to uh, Columbus. I'll join you after the handover. Stephanie, this is EV1. I'll copy. Got you loud and clear after the handover. Sorry about that. Oh, great, no worries. Yes, you can. I reported my safer handles are down, and I'm ready for next step. Yes, and we copy. Uh, you're in a good config. Um, we copy thermal cover closed. You can translate to Columbus. Translate port on phase one to mile marker 7590. The Nader on the Starboard Lab strut to handrail 252, and I'll have more words for you there. Copy that. And Stephanie, I've got the wire tie on the cable. I did not use one of my own. I just used the one that Christina had placed on the other cable. And we copy. Thanks for the report. That's a good config. You can egress the truss to check your safer handles down. Jessica, we can do a two-way safer handle check if you want, because similar to you, I wouldn't mind a pair of eyes. I see you coming. Do you see mine right now? Okay. I, I see yours. See your left one. Let's take a look for your right one. Hey, Moose. I can see your, right, your PCT is blocking your right one right now. Okay. Yeah, that may be the case. See it. It's, up. it's oh. down. Yep. Okay. And spin the other way, and I can see your left, and that's down as well. Okay. And I'll look for yours. I got that one. I'll take the one behind the PGP. It is also down. Okay. Thank you. So, Stephanie, we are both here at the same location <laughs> at the MDM. I'm finished with the work here, so let me know what you suggest. Checking. All right, I think I can get by you, Jessica. So, that to the work site. Okay. And at this point, we'd like uh, Jessica to uh, translate first to the CP13 location, and then Christina is clear to uh, translate uh, to Columbus. So I will move farther port, Jessica, so that you can head down. Okay. Is she taking the starboard seat? Yeah. Star she's yeah. the starboard, Bob? Okay. Yeah. All right. Out of the way. All right, thanks. Christina, Jessica, please uh, hold your translation. After uh, further discussion, we'd like Jessica's tether to go over Christina's. Okay, I'm already down on the lab. And I can see my tether running straight back to the point now. So do we need to do a switch here? I do see that they are across. I'm not sure if Christina progresses. We're checking. Please stand by. Um, yeah. Okay. Seems like if I were to just go, if you were to move forward on the port side of the lab, and I were to head down and say starboard, yeah, I don't think it's going to make a difference. There is a twist there. I don't know if you can see it. Past those two boxes. 
No, I can't. I can see where it comes together at those boxes. Yeah, so it's right behind that. And it's not, maybe, it might not be a twist. I think, um, I think that mine is just underneath yours. Uh-huh. Jessica, Christina, um, if the two of you can uh, see your tethers, we're happy for you to manage it uh, as you see fit. Okay. So, yeah, Christina, I can see it. I think that mine is just under yours, and I don't think since we're both going out from here, it's going to make a difference. When we go back to clean up the tethers, we'll just have to double-check that. Yeah, you can just spin one around the other when you remove one of the big hooks. Right. Okay. So, so I from what you're seeing, if I were to come down from starboard and just head forward, saying that that looks okay, in your view of this? I think so. Hold on. Let me take another look. I can start moving in that direction to kind of get a feel for what, what they would do. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. I can't really see it now. But I think you're pulling mine right now. See what's happening with my tether? behind my back. I think that might be because you're moving yours. I just don't have the clarity to, just to tell if that's a full twist or... Christina, it's tough to tell. Christina, Jessica, if you're comfortable, we feel we can uh, work with this uh, during cleanup. And if you're comfortable with that, then you can press ahead uh, toward the tasks. I am comfortable with that. Um, what I would like to do is just reevaluate once I get forward, Jessica, and make sure that because this can dig, um, you know, nope, she's not going to be snagging mine a lot. And then uh, just because you're cleaning up, it sounds like you are comfortable with it carrying any twists back and then doing them at that time. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you can tell that, like, my cat is behaving really strangely right now because it's on that twist point. It's um, with you, your tether there, it's kind of bobbing around. Maybe once I move forward of you, the twist will move towards us so we can get better eyes on it. Okay. All right, so I'm going to continue to move forward on the starboard side, and um, I'll make sure that my tether stays over you and then get caught on your, the back of your foot. Okay, copy. And, and yes, it does appear to just be not a twist, but this is just over mine, and once I move forward, I think they'll stop pulling. Okay, but can you see mine right now? I can. It's coming off of your left side, straight back to the tether point. Off my left side? Yeah, so it's coming, it's like in front of you. From it's, It is from your right D-ring extender, but, you know, across your body. Was it behind me? It's not behind your back, but it's just off of your left side. So, for example, if you put your feet towards it, it would come it would come down in front of you, and then if you wanted it on your right side, you could put your feet back down. Christina, Jessica, once you two are stable at your task, location, task locations, I'll take a glove and a half check. Happy. And Stephanie, um, were you going to talk me along my translation path? I am currently at the forward side of the lab and code. Yes. And if you're close to handrail 0271, you translate starboard and nader to lab handrail. 0272, and then forward to node 2, and then forward on to node 2. Happy. Hey, I have eyes on that. And Christina, one more second on my safety yeah. tether. So I think it's, it's wrapped around me right now, right? So I yeah. get to spin my legs around. Let me get eyes on one moment. It's just off of your left side. So... It's not around you. It's off of your left side and towards the back. If you, for example, put your feet towards structure and towards the truss, and then now kick them up, 
There it goes. There it goes. Okay, that's yep. it. Perfect. Yep. I see it now. Thanks. Yep. And now ours are deconflicted, so they're not crossing. Um, once I move forward, they won't be crossing, but they're just going to each. There, there will be, you know, one will be over the other, but just by virtue of where the anchors are. Okay, copy. I think I also see that. Jessica, when you go back to the anchors, it looks like yours is also um, just around a couple boxes that okay. are right underneath the CETA rail. Um, so just be mindful of that when you go back that way. Okay, copy. And um, it's right over, you know, uh, over PMM. When you're over PMM, just look and pop your safety tether off of those. Okay, copy. And I am on no two. Copy, Christina. Once you see node 2 handrail 332, then you'll translate forward along the gap spanner to node 2 handrail 345. That's the green hook location. The inward. Stephanie, I'm at 288, and I see the, I think I see the cable I'm looking for. It's labeled um, Fire Tie CP13, but Whiskey Tango CP13. That's all right, uh, CP13, Wire uh, Tie CP13. Okay, so it looks like I just need to take off this one wire tie, and that it is integral on the cable. Is that what you're expecting? That's affirmed, Jessica, and there are three cautions. Avoid inadvertent contact with the wettest stanchion. Do not use EWC antennas as handholds. Avoid inadvertent contact with the seed light. Copy. So, Anne, you were just saying that this, this is looking a little familiar? <laughs> That is very familiar worksite. Uh, the bundle that Jessica is picking up right now is actually the last uh, task that I did on my last spacewalk uh, back in April. Uh, so we attached uh, just over uh, where Jessica's head is right now at the front of the lab, we attached the base of that cable and she's going to be picking up uh, that bundle and moving it uh, all the way back to what we call the rat's nest on the aft side of the lab. And so uh, it is kind of fun uh, watching a task that you left out there and uh, and seeing somebody uh, go, go pick it up. So. And, and now she'll kind of move along the uh, port side of the lab back to the rat's nest, uh, which got its name because of all the cable connections that are back there. So uh, you have to be very careful when you do the translation that she's about to do. When you say that uh, you're just wire tying something down, that seems that sounds really simple, but uh, I'm guessing that in the gloves, that makes it a little little more difficult. Yes, actually, uh, putting cables down can be really exhausting on the hands. Uh, uh, well, part of the most complicated part of the spacesuit design is actually the gloves, uh, because they are pressurized just like the rest of the suit. And so these gloves, if you relax your fingers, you're going to see the fingers go forward at about 45 degrees, which means in order to either fully open or fully close the hands requires force uh, by the spacewalkers. And so when you watch these two spacewalkers translate, you'll actually notice that they don't grab onto the handrail. They often just tuck their hand behind a handrail, uh, and that prevents them, that kind of saves their hands over this many, many hour long uh, spacewalk. It saves their hand fatigue. And so what Jessica is going to be doing is installing wire ties, uh, which are just basically kind of like little twist 
ties, uh, while well, they're large twist ties. And so she's going to put the cable down next to a handrail and then use one of those metal wire ties uh, to create twists. You're going to hear her call three twists, and that's what we've determined is a safe configuration that will um, that'll keep that cable onto the handrail for a long period of time. So you'll hear her call three twists, and then she'll kind of tuck it down so it's a low profile so that the next space walker that comes out can still use that handrail. For my translation here, I know I need to get it um, along the Venus on the M cone and underneath that cable tray, but I don't think I can translate there because of all this. Without the gap spinner, I don't think I can get over the cable tray. So I've got the cable with me, and I've let out some of the wire ties. So I'm going to translate back over the cable tray and then go forward. Was that what you guys were envisioning? Checking. Stephanie, I'll give you the glove and half when I'm in place on the Columbus head cone, Stubborn end cone, if that's all right with you. That works for Cena, thank you. Happy. To give you a little more on that, Stephanie, what I'm thinking is I'm going to go over the cable tray, then go forward on those handrails, and then I'll go back port a bit, and I'll be able to pass the cable rail under the tray from the other side. Jessica, we like your plan. Okay. Jessica has eyes on that face each other. Um, they are crossed close to the area where they're um, behind some boxes under the cedar rail. That's just starboard of the starboard cedar cart, so no change to the config that we had when we first came out and that we're expecting to clean up when you do face each other at the end. Okay, copy. You were talking about uh, a little a little bit about how the gloves are to work in. We actually have a question from a uh, uh, online uh, someone online who's following along. This one is from Denise, and her class would like to know how the gloves work. They actually are asking if they're they're magnetic, which I guess would be useful. <laughs> Yeah, that is actually a great idea. We should look into that. But uh, this version of the gloves are not magnetic. Um, they fit like a puffy um, ski glove would. However, they're very complicated inside. Uh, as I kind of mentioned, your hands get very fatigued over a long period of time. So the better the gloves can fit, the better you're going to be able to work. Uh, so they actually work uh, just like a normal glove, which means it's your hand inside that's moving the gloves. No and special tricks. No special tricks, unfortunately. Uh, but they are an extremely important part of the uh, spacesuit, especially to prevent from any cuts. And so you hear them often doing glove checks. Uh, and that's because, as you can see, uh, these spacewalkers are touching and grabbing a lot of different things on the space station. And the space station was designed not to have any sharp edges that could cut a glove. But over time, micrometeoroid strikes can cause sharp edges on the outside of space station. So we're very aware of uh, inadvertently getting a cut in those gloves. And you see the gray layer on their palms. That's actually part of a triple protection system on their palms. And so the, on the closest to their hand is what we call the Vectran, and that's kind of a very tightly woven material uh, that prevents from cuts. On the high wear areas, uh, mainly on the pointer finger and the thumb, uh, and, and some of the uh, finger crotches, we have what we call, call turtle skin, which is another reinforced layer to prevent cuts. And then the outside rubber layer is the RTV. And so um, we, there's different criteria that the safety folks on the ground here track on what's allowable damage on a glove during an EVA. They do inspections beforehand, inspections afterwards. And they are pressurized gloves. And so uh, we also have a palm bar uh, that's just basically a bar that goes right across the palm of the hand that you can tighten down that gives you kind of a, a fulcrum uh, that you can bend your hand over. So mm. it's not exactly like working on the ground, uh, but they are a pretty fantastic design. They are one of the most tricky parts to design and size for spacesuit designers. And actually inside every single one of those fingers at every finger joint, uh, they can adjust the sizing on it down to the millimeter. So each of these gloves are uh, custom made and custom sized for the astronauts. They just need magnets. If they could add magnets, then that might be great. Copy, Jessica. Understand you're at handrail 269 and working the routing.
Still seeing a view here from uh, Jessica Mears helmet camera looking at that uh, Ethernet cable that she's working to tie down. We're going to be routing it over to a, a video stanchion support assembly where one of the video cameras on the exterior of the space station is. Jessica, for the cable routing, we show PET at uh, six hours, about seven minutes, and uh, we're thinking ahead to uh, clean up and ingress. What we'd like to do because of the time is to um, help alleviate any problems early. At this point, we'd like you to tie off the wire cable that you're working so diligently to route and then head back towards yours and Christina's tethers and take a look at them and see if there's anything that uh, needs to be done to uh, straighten them out. Okay, copy. Stephanie, I have the crew lock bag on 938, and I am also DRT to 938. Copy, Christina. There's a warning and a caution. Minimize extended contact with exposed trunnion and scuff plates. Maintain positive inward force on bolts while installing Pulling the T-stop away from structure could prematurely engage the bolt lockout mechanism. Copy. Stephanie, I've got the cable routed underneath the cable tray, and I'll get it on a wire tie on 269, which I believe was the first spot for it anyway. Jessica, we like your plan. Christina, you'll need to do a socket swap onto the seven inch rigid. A little bit, but I, I believe I'm putting the five sixteenths on my PGT. That's right, five sixteenths by seven inch rigid socket on your PGT. The Copy, ret to you and retrieve the uh, T-stop using uh, one of your uh, work, uh, mini workstation rets. Okay, and I'm still working on getting the swap onto the PGT. That was just a removal of the one that was on the seat. Copy, thanks for the clarification. Okay, Stephanie, and the cable is secure on handrail 269. Copy, Jessica. Okay, the 516 7-inch rigid is installed in the PGT. Good pull test. I'm going for the T-stop. Copy, Christina. Stephanie, should I just translate back the way I came and then head up to the truss up via the starboard lab strut? Checking. Jessica, that's correct. Translate back uh, following your safety tether. Let us know if you uh, encounter anything along the way. Okay, copy. 
Jessica Mayer getting that uh, wire bundle tied down uh, in a somewhere between where it started and where she was heading to give her time to work out, uh, check out her tethers before she needs to head back to the airlock. Meanwhile, Christina Cook is at Columbus getting ready to uh, install the the extra support for the truncheon that will eventually hold a, a new uh, platform for experiments on the outside of Columbus, Bartolomeo. Copy, lock it out with slack. And that's another task that you're familiar with, right, Ann? That is correct, yes. Christina is actually working a task that uh, we attempted to do, David St. Jacques and I attempted to do on a spacewalk in April, and uh, we found that the equipment on the outside of the space station was not in the configuration that we expected, so the equipment that we had to install, install these slip-off pins uh, wouldn't actually work, so they redesigned them, and uh, Christina is going to install them now on the trunnions. And what they are basically just plugs that go on uh, the end of uh, trunnions, which are kind of empty pipes. If you think about a hollow pipe sticking off the front of Space Station, that's kind of the best way to picture it. And these slip-off prevention uh, pins are going to go on the end. And then later, there's a, uh, a payload from ESA, from our European partners, uh, that's going to fly up and actually attach onto the trunnions, and this will keep that payload attached. Uh, be aware there is no soft dock feature. To get that attached, Christina Cook will be driving four bolts, uh, or at least getting them set in and then uh, tightening them up before she puts one more bolt in the in the center of the of the of the uh, the support, the cap that she's putting on the end of the trunnion. And I am ready for PGT settings. PGT settings, Bravo 1, clockwise 2. Copy, and I'll be doing a cow, so stand by. Copy. Okay, and I see your tether running back along the lab, and mine was caught in my PGT, so I just freed it. And I'm going to head up the lab to starboard. Copy, Jessica. Good path. PGT settings, Bravo 1, half-off-wise 2. Christina, those are good PGT settings. Christina, on the TSOP, verify no gap between the TSOP and the trunnion. Gap. Copy, no gap. While maintaining positive force on the TSOP toward the trunnion, we'll be working first with bolt one. You'll push on the bolt while driving and drive it only 14 turns. 14, one, four turns. Good read back. Turn. 
I am applying, um, Stephanie, quick report. I am applying downward force, and the T-stop itself is still floating up. I think maybe the bolt is starting to engage, but the bolt is not rigidly connected to the T-stop. I think this is the feature that we talked about where it's um, in some threads and it just dropped down, and now it's engaging into the trunnion pin. If you agree, I'll keep driving. We copy the report. Christina, keep driving. Copy your work. Fourteen turns on bolt one. Copy 1414 turns on bolt one. Next is bolt two. Push on the bolt while driving. Driving bolt two, drive bolt two only seven turns. Seven turns for bolt two, starting turns. Okay, so I am at the twist in my tethers. So right now, Christina's tether is seven turns, bolt two. Copy Christina, seven turns, bolt two. Bolt three, push on the bolt while driving, seven turns only. Seeing a good view here of Jessica working on the tether issue that we've been discussing a little bit. And we talked earlier about how important tethers were. And actually, we have a question from uh, one of the online followers with using the Ask NASA hashtag, this one from Arthur, asking, what would happen if an astronaut's tether breaks loose? As in, that what ties down this, the astronaut to the space station is broken and the astronaut swings away from the space station. Yes, that is a scenario that we definitely do not want to get into and that we've trained a lot to avoid. Um, but uh, that is where if you were to completely come off a of station without your tether, uh, you have on your back, you can actually see a good shot of Jessica there, um, right down by her left hip, uh, you can see a kind of a box that's on the bottom of her life support system. And that is actually called the SAFER, the Simplified Aid for EVA Rescue. <coughs> And that, uh, that is kind of like a small jet pack that you can use. A hand controller will come out. You can fly yourself back to the space station. Uh, that said, these tethers are actually very robust. Uh, they are braided metal. And so the, it would require a significant amount of force to actually break a tether off of the space station. Uh, uh, and, so, and we never, we never actually are in a scenario that we're not tethered. So we always say, make before you break. And so as you see them working with tethers or moving anchors, you're always gonna be, uh, hear them be very clear about what tether they have down, that it's locked before they undo another tether for their safety. And so what Jessica is actually working on is we're not worried about it breaking. We just wanna get it, it looks like maybe it's tangled a little bit. That is correct. They're just a, there's just one twist in it, and uh, this happens all the time. Uh, when you think about uh, these two spacewalkers uh, are tethered about the same, their anchors of their tethers are anchored at about the same place, and they have been going all over the space station, uh, 50 meters one direction, 50 meters the other direction, and, uh, and so it is quite common to get a twist in it. Uh, so what they're having Jessica do is just clean up that twist. So a couple ways you can do that. You can move your body back around the safety tether just to take the twist out of it, uh, or you can uh, uh, anchor another safety tether down and actually undo the safety tether to move it. Um, but no safety concerns here, just uh, more kind of cleaning up the tether so they don't rub on each other. Is that the kind of thing that you train for in the neutral buoyancy lab? Yes, absolutely. Tether awareness is actually one of the biggest safety uh, tasks that we train in the neutral buoyancy lab. We always have our tethers. Our tether protocol is very specific. You're going to hear a lot of uh, back and forth between the spacewalkers and the ground as they confirm the configuration. And uh, I can tell you, having been outside, that uh, it's something that you are extremely aware of at all times. You're checking them. Uh, uh, the, the spacewalkers call out a check uh, maybe every 15, 20 minutes, but I guarantee you they're looking at their safety tethers uh, just every couple minutes, make sure they're not caught on anything and that they're in a good configuration. We actually have another question. This one is not related to tethers or, or spacewalks at all, but um, since it is uh, uh, from uh, Jessica Mears' home state, uh, we have one from Sheila 
And the third grade students of Kennebuck, Maine want to know how long it takes to get to the space station. And they add the hashtag proud of Jessica. <laughs> well, I am proud of Jessica too today and Christina as well. Um, so, and she is from Maine. So hello everybody from uh, Maine on Jessica's behalf. So to travel from the surface of the earth up to the space station, uh, the way that, uh, if you were to go directly there, uh, it would take a lot less time. But what we do is we launch from the surface of the earth. It takes about nine minutes to get to orbit. Uh, so into a place where we are weightlessness and going around the world. And then we play catch up with the space station. So the space station's on a little bit of a higher orbit. And so we speed up the, uh, w currently w these, uh, these astronauts launched on the Soyuz spacecraft. And so they accelerate the Soyuz spacecraft and just kind of chase it uh, using gravity and orbital mechanics. And it took about uh, six hours from her to get from the safe surface of the earth all the way to the space station. I feel like that is impressively fast. It is uh, shorter than a lot of road trips we've been on. <laughs> exactly. 11.9 turk, seven turns, green light on bolt three, bolt four, six to 13 turns. Christina Cook still working on those uh, bolts, uh, getting the uh, the cap on in place on the trunnion that will hold a, an external platform for science on, on Columbus. Turn, green LED, 11.8 foot-pounds of torque. 11.8 torque, seven and a half turns, green light on bolt four. Verify no gap between the T-stop and the trunnion. Gap. Copy no gap, install bolt five to torque six to nine turns. Oh, yeah. Turns on bolt five, green LED, 12.0 actual torque. Copy 12 on the torque and green light, say again, turns. Nine. I believe you said nine turns for bolt five. That's affirmative, niner. Copy that, unlock and release the ret from the TSOP and uh, Deconfigure your PGT, place the uh, six, the seven inch rigid uh, onto the socket caddy. Christina Cook, they're finishing up that installation on the uh, the trunnion, the cap on the trunnion that will be used for a future uh, ex platform on the end of the Columbus module for science experiments on the outside of the space station. Here out here, then you come through the windows inside. Really, really incredible view. Copy that. Very nice. Jessica Muir taking uh, advantage of a little downtime to get some photos. Uh, crew members uh, now six hours and 25 minutes into today's space walk. They finished installing the new battery charge discharge unit about three hours ago, and we are hearing reports here on the ground now that uh, it is looking good. And uh, there is actually charging the batteries, so that is a, definitely a good sign. Uh, getting a good check out now that uh, it's installed and that uh, that can be. Uh, that can be a good report on the space walk work done today. You can bundle up the crew lock bag, head back uh, along your translation route, and picking up your green hook at uh, node 2345.
Christina, Jessica, to give you a report uh, on your work today. We show that the battery charge discharge unit is fully powered up and working. That is awesome news. Thank you. Amazing news, Stephanie. That makes us very happy. Makes us very happy as well. And we're one minute from uh, 20 second LOS. Happy that. Christina, once you have the crew lock bag retrieved and uh, you're happy with its position on your BRT and you show the work site clear, you can start to uh, translate uh, start to translate back in and retrieve your green hook. While we are waiting uh, to get video back from the space station, we have a few more of the good luck uh, uh, messages that have been flooding in. This one from Miss Barkas showing that uh, they are watching the the uh, spacewalk in their classroom in Pennsylvania. And uh, thanks for uh, making her story. And also uh, one from Amanda showing her daughter watching the spacewalk. Lots of great uh, messages coming in from all around, all across the country and around the world, uh, letting us know that uh, you're watching. So we appreciate that. Keep sending those in. Here's one from the Girl Scouts. Uh, they recently completed the Cadet Space Science Badge and exciting for the mission. Wishing uh, Christina Cook and Jessica Mears safe travels. Retrieving my green hook. Copy, green hook retrieval and work. Green hook retrieved, moving on. No one of these translations involves the gap scanner. Jim Lily backwards. I believe it's this one. And we concur. It should uh, be taking you aft towards no two handrail three three two.
I'm not. But the great guy is. I'm on the new two alpha income. And on the left. Copy. For Jessica, as you were checking out the safety tethers, can you tell us, did you need to translate onto the CETA cart? Uh, no, I didn't. I stopped just starboard of the CETA cart to get a view because at that point, somehow Christina's tether had gotten to the left of me and my tether was on the right of me, but I was able to get it underneath my legs and to the other side and they're both on the right side and then I had a good view straight down. So I didn't actually go up on the seat of cart. We copy. Thank you, you for the report. Place? I'm happy to just give them another tap again and just in case. And Jessica, thanks for the offer. If you'd like to, you can, but it's not required. Okay, copy. Thanks. And I am at the lab. Copy, Christina. Copy. Christina Cook there making her way back to the airlock. Getting close to the end of today's spacewalk, we're at the six hour and 36 minute mark, uh, about an hour longer than the spacewalk was originally planned to go, but the crew was able to get a lot done in that time. Copy. And I'm at the airlock. Copy that. Thermal cover open. Copy thermal cover open. Can ingress the airlock and attach waste tether to the waste tether on the airlock D-ring extender. My waist tether is attached to the airlock waist tether. Both large hooks are gate closed slider lock. And I can confirm that the small hook of the airlock waist tether is still locked on the airlock theory tether. Copy. 
Copy. Checking. Christina, we're in a period of ready com. Uh, we believe you uh, dropped out. We missed the, the small hook config. Small hook is the closed outer lock of the airlock derailed tether. That's the small hook of the airlock waist tether. I can also confirm that my small hook of my waist tether is gate closed outer lock of my left derailed tether. We copy good config. And is this where I get just to go? We're checking. And as a safety precaution, Jessica, we would like you to lock your waist tether first before any further safety tether config. Okay, copy, that's in work. My safety tether is locked. And Jessica, I copy. I believe you mean to to your waist tether is locked. This guy copied. Sorry, we're still in Radicom. And I believe you meant. Jessica, you probably have me okay, right? I I think it's fine. To, yeah. yeah, it's fine between us. I just I'll just say hi. Jessica, <laughs> no, I think we should wait. Yeah, I do too. Jessica, we're back with you. Double check your waist tether locked. Yes, my waist tether is locked. Copy word. 30 seconds to a 20 second handover. Crews making their way back into the airlock, or actually already getting into the airlock, but uh, we're in a period where we don't have uh, video of it at the moment. So while that's happening, I'll just give you the lowdown on the airlock. Um, Everything is obviously, you know, not cut down. Chris. And the voice communications with the crew is a little bumpy as well. You know, when you come in, it'll still be, since that's the final ingress, that'll be when things get cleaned up and a good config for me to come in. Okay, sounds good. In the DCBU. Copy. Jessica, remove EV1's anchor hook from handrail 3651 and attach it to EV2's red reel. Okay, copy, that's in work.
Christina, if you've not done so already, you can stow the Get Ahead Crew Lock bag in the airlock. Okay, I'm doing, I've done that, and now I'm just kind of cleaning up the container here. Copy that. Stephanie, I have removed the twist. I have Christina's anchor hook closed and locked on my red reel. Copy. Now retrieve your anchor hook from handrail 3650 and stow it on your mini workstation. What? My anchor hook is on my mini workstation. Copy that. You can translate to the airlock. Stephanie, I take it back. I did translate on the um, the cart coming out here and going back, so I will give those breaks another release. We copy, Jessica. Okay, and that is complete on the starboard seat of cart. Copy.
Christina and Jessica, I have some words on Jessica's suit. There is potential to receive a battery volt decay message. That would be bat V decay on EV2's Jessica's suit. We expect that in perhaps 20 minutes. When that message enunciates, you have one hour left of battery power. Connecting the SCU to your DCM fixes the problem. Okay. Thank you. I am coming down to see the spur, Christina. I see you. Welcome back. I am on the positioned on the aft side. Good. View here of Jessica Mir making her way back to the Quest airlock, home base for the spacewalk. Christina Cook's already there, hanging out, waiting for her. Hello. Nice job. Start today. Two. Sunrise in two minutes. Happy. Hey, Christina, you have a go for me to get, get underneath here and get in? I believe so. That's the company, but I believe that's okay. We concur. You know, I should have put that bag under a bungee too, but I didn't notice it. It was up. It was up when I was in there before. I think that will be easy to move around. Okay. It might be nice up on the bungee just so it's not interfering with that closure. I only thought if you're able to pop it under. Okay. Without too much hassle. Pull in, I'll push you up. Just pop your foot on the, the side of the thermal cover hinge. Yeah. And if you want to get here, I'll push you back there. There you go. But I'm still not quite vertical. Yep. Nice. There we go. Nailed it. I'm really not sure how to have the CCDU here. It was tucking up um, again, you know, like we were talking about half um, port side in towards the wall. And I think once you're in, it will be more likely to just sort of stay there. Yeah. Trying to get it back in that position now. Okay just kind of floating above the UIA and this, yeah, ORU bag is also on the way. One thing uh, you had to fix a couple of was those suits that are on it are big tether snags. So if it's better not going where you want it to go, check the scoop. Okay, copy. So I've got it. You were able to get it the long way up the wall? Yes. Okay. But that was before I put the crew lock guy behind that bungee. I, but I think you still should, and that would actually help the interference with the crew lock bag. And it might be the. There you go. Yep. Miran Cook starting to. Move back into the Quest airlock. Uh, this video coming from Jessica Mirror's helmet camera. Spacewalk won't be uh, considered done, however. Take your time. I think this is a, a time and a good investment in a, our closing airlock ops. So. Spacewalk won't be considered over, though, until they begin repressurizing the Quest airlock.
Okay, I've got it vertical. Great. I don't think I'm going to be able to get any bungees around it. Were you envisioning? No. Okay. I don't think so either. I've got it vertical, and then I'm going to try to get this. Or you bag off of the, okay. So I've got it vertical now. Seems to want to rotate. This view coming from Christina Cook's helmet camera. Looking down into the Quest airlock where Jessica Mir is already inside. Yeah. I'm just going to keep a hand on it right now. Okay. Um, and then I'm not sure if I'm going to be out of your way enough to ingress. Yeah. You're definitely enough support, but is, is it possible to move your feet forward? Yeah, like that. Okay. Yep. Okay. I can stay in this position and I'm holding the DCDU. Okay. Copy. Stephanie, do I have a go to ingress? Checking. Christina, you have a go to ingress friendly reminder to uh, check access to the thermal cover. And Christina, I did not move that crewlock bag, so if you wanted to, okay. you need to do that. I'm trying to head first to ingress. Okay, copy. And the crewlock bag is in a good spot. Now, if you need me to move, okay. Other option, if you're not going to be able to get your feet all the way in because of the CDU, if we put it lengthwise, then you could probably put your feet over it. Okay, I don't know if that's what's happening right now. It was just a. Looks like you're almost in. I'm gonna move my feet port now. Okay. So if you're able to see them, we know if I'm walking them in a bad spot. Okay, they're right up against. Going to be right up against the, the BDCDU. Okay. Can you bring them more toward me? More station more forward. Forward. Or forward. Yep. That. There you go. You're good. You're underneath the BCDU now. Above you. Happy? Do you need to come more port? No. Okay, and I'm going for the thermal cover. Okay, copy. Right now, your feet are in between me and the BCDU. Okay. But you have enough room, it's just you won't be able to move too much in either direction. I'm going to move as far station forward as I can for you. I see your feet. I can help guide them if you want. Okay. Will that help? Okay, they're, now they're in between the BCDU and me. Okay, I see that. I'm 
Stephanie, thermal cover is closed. Copy, thermal cover closed. Nice work. You can remove your SCUs from the stowage pouch. For both of us, then? That's affirmed for both EV1 and EV2. Okay, SC is removed from the pouch. Copy, remove DCM cover, Velcro to the DCM and connect your SEUs to your DCMs. Work. Once again, we're getting close to the end of today's spacewalk now at uh, just a few seconds under seven hours, but we're not quite done yet. We won't uh, call it officially over until the crew begins repressurizing the Quest airlock. They are both now back in the airlock, however, and have one of uh, one part of the hatch closed, the, the thermal cover that, that protects the uh, main part of the hatch. I do see that. I, mine were not routed correctly either right now. Let me see. Yeah, I was conflicting a lot of this, but knew it would end up in the end. I see the rep. Now, hold on. I'm going to release the rep from the ORU bag. Not going anywhere. I'll reattach it. Okay, I got that rep free. Happy. Okay, my SCU is on and locked. And I'm going to need to reorient Christina so I can get mine routed correctly. Okay. But the DCDU is flipping up now. Okay. Let's do that. Because of your SCU. And I had to put kind of a lot of uh, elbow grease into getting it oriented correctly. Like once you get it started, it, it cooperates. And we copy, Christina, your SEU is connected to your DCM for EV1. Jessica is reworking a repositioning, and uh, that is in work for EV2. It's a good read. I can see if I can hold it for you. I might need to, to twist it the other direction. Let's see. Yeah, see if you can put that loop the other way. There you go. That was better. Yeah, I can't get it around, but there you go. Can't get it further than that though. It's an angle. Can you see that if my if mine it's just it, it's not caught on anything, it's just the routing. It just needs to you just have to kinda put it where you need it. But I don't see that it's actually caught on anything. If it's free. Awesome. Okay. I am on and and locked. It's work. I missed you too. I know. <laughs> Okay, Copy connected and locked for the SCU for EV2. Nice work. For EV1 and EV2, take your water switches to off, OFF, that's the forward position. Expect water is off message. EV1, water off. EV2, water off. Copy EV1, EV2, and this starts a two minute timer.
Christina, while we wait, you can verify the outer hatch is clear of hardware. Copy, it works. All right, this is where I'll need to thread the needle again with my legs. Okay, stand by. Let me see if I can help you because the BCD has moved a bit. I think you're also up against your SCU with your, your leg. Okay. It's on the side of the okay. you now. Well, I see what it is. It's the scoop on the BCD that's holding me up. If we need to, I can try to take one of those off. Right now, I'm having trouble getting any more port at all. Can you scooch port at all? Yeah, I'm right up against the hat okay. now. Does that help? Yeah. Are you waiting? to get your SCU off another piece of Velcro so that it has more play, but okay. behind the BCDU now, so I can't reach it. Okay. And the hatch is clear of hardware. Copy hatch is clear of hardware. Christina, on the thermal cover, we would like you to do a double check of the tabs, of the Velcro tabs, and double check that they are all inside. Christina, I've also just able to move the BCDU much further. Work? Okay. So I think you should have more space. We're looking at one of the uh, external Stephanie? camera views, and we think we might see a, a tab outside. But uh, we'll take your report. Um, if you could explain about the tabs, it is closed and aligned, and the the you know magnetic is holding it in, and I see very few gaps all around. So it seems to be well positioned. And when you say Velcro, I don't see any Velcro in my view. Copy. Uh, opposite of the hinge, there is a Velcro strap. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Set up. Uh-huh. Yes. And I hold it back in. Let's see. Yep, it is in. Yeah, I, that was out of my view, so thanks for talking me on to that. Okay, nicely done. Double checking something? And we copy nice work on the thermal cover. Copy the uh, hardware is clear. Verify hatch handle and position for the hatch decal. Saw there, uh, Christina Cook and uh, Jessica Mears crewmates waiting on the other side of the uh, hatch for the Quest airlock, uh, waiting to welcome them back inside the space station. Take a few minutes. And Jessica and and um, Drew and I were in here. He was able to tip down and actually look at that handle. It's you actually have a great view of it. 
you're able to. Oh, no, I've got a view in. It's in place. Okay. Copy hatch handle in position for the decal. Now you can close and lock the hatch. And work. So seeing a view here from Christina Cook's helmet camera inside the Quest airlock. She and Jessica Mir are both safely inside and uh, just about to close the hatch that goes to the outside of the Quest airlock. After that, they'll be able to begin deep uh, repressurizing the uh, the uh, the Quest airlock, and that is what will actually signal the end of today's spacewalk. Any direction I can try to move? No, I would say port, but I know that I'm not. I'm all the way up against the hatch now. You hear of uh, Christina Cook working to get that hatch closed. That, again, uh, does not signal quite the end of the spacewalk. We'll wait until they begin repressurizing the Quest airlock to call the spacewalk over. And even after uh, after the spacewalk does end, we'll keep uh, covering their work to get uh, the Quest repressurized so that they can come back to inside the space station and get out of their spacesuits. See the hatch is closed and locked. This works. Copy EB hatch closed and locked. With that, we show the detailed timeline complete. We transition now to the repress cue card with some checks for both EB1 and EB2. Check SCU connected to DCM. EB1 connected. EB2 connected. Copy, check water switches are off. Water is off, easy one. Off, easy two. Christina, check EV hatch closed and locked. EV hatch closed and locked. On the UIA, Jessica, check oxygen EMU one and two. Two valves are open. They're both open. 
Jessica, take power EB1, EB2, two switches to on. Good work. Power for EV1 and EV2 are on. Copy, check power. 18.8. Check. 18.6 volts for both. Copy, 18.6 volts. Check power EV1, EV2, EMU LEDs, two of them on. Confirm. Copy, on your DCMs, take power to SCU. Expect a warning tone. Power in SCU. Maybe two in SCU. Copy that. And with that, Christina and Jessica, with your outstanding work today, you have restored 2B to full power and completed some get ahead tasks. On behalf of the NASA team, we thank you, and it has been a pleasure to work with you today. Stephanie, is, the pleasure has been all ours. It has been truly great to work with you. Christina and Stephanie, it's been an incredible display of teamwork. Congratulations to the teams in Houston, all of our colleagues that planned an unforeseen spacewalk in just a few days. Christina and I feel extremely privileged that doing our job today meant working with all of you, contributing to what NASA does best, rising to the challenge. And today was especially an honor, as we also recognize that this is a milestone. It symbolizes exploration by all that dare to dream and work hard to achieve that dream. Not only that, it's a tribute to those that paved the way for us to be where we are. We hope an inspiration to all future explorers. Christina, Jessica, we appreciate those words very much. It's a very heartfelt sentiment, and we very much appreciate your words. And with that, I'll hand you over to Drew. Christina and Jessica, incredible work today. Welcome home. We're glad to have you back, and we're so proud to be up here with you. With that, on your DCM, if you would, please take your O2 actuator to press. It's great to hear your voice again, and great to be back home. Great to hear your voice, Drew, and EV2 is in press. Copy EV2 in press. EV-1 is impressed. EV-1 impressed. Christina, check that the EV hatch MPEV is closed. Closed. Be closed. All right, I'm going to start to pressurize with the IV hatch equalization valve, and you let me know. I'll periodically check in with you on the rate. Be copy. Copy. All right, EV1, EV2, how's the rate? Good rate. I'm a little imperceptible so far. Concur. Okay, we'll increase it slightly. I wanted to let you know that when the crew lock is at 4.0, you can expect an alert tone. Copy. Copy.
With the repressurization of the Quest airlock now in work, Christina Cook and Jessica Mears safely back inside the Quest airlock. We are calling the end of today's spacewalk as 1.55 p.m. Central Time. They spent a total of seven hours and 17 minutes outside the space station on what was a historic spacewalk, the first to feature two women on the outside of the space station. You heard lots of uh, words about that from both of them. And uh, we also have uh, Anne McLean here with us. And uh, I know that, uh, that as, a, as a spacewalker yourself and a female astronaut, it probably has some, some significance for you as well. If you want it, but yes, today is definitely a significant event uh, for everybody involved in it, and especially uh, uh, just huge praise for Jessica and Christina today. Uh, they did an amazing job. Uh, you know, the saying is that if you want to go fast, you go alone, but if you want to go far, you go together. And our NASA team, together with all of our international partners, is an example of what humans can accomplish when each person contributes their best, regardless of nationality, sexuality, gender, religion, or handicap. Jessica and Christina uh, grew up having a dream of space flight. Uh, they represented uh, men and women everywhere accomplishing what they did today. We are so proud of them, and it is just so special to be sitting here and getting to observe this, uh, this day in history. It really is. Thank you so much for being here with us to watch it. We appreciate all your help and all the help answering questions today. Anytime. Glad to be here. And once again, we did uh, see that spacewalk today ending at one hour uh, sorry, 1.55 p.m. Central Time. That uh, lasted a total of seven hours and 17 minutes, and we'll come back to you in just a few minutes with some additional statistics. Hey, Christina, Jessica, how's the rate? Feel good for me? For me. Okay, copy. I see airlock P 4.1. Copy. Okay, Christina, Jessica, we are at 5.0, and we're going to wait two minutes for cool lock pressure to stabilize. Okay.
Okay, as I promised, we do have some stats ready for you. Um, today's spacewalk was the 221st in support of space station assembly and maintenance. Uh, and the eighth this year conducted from the space station. That's the fourth for Christina Cook. She's now got 27 hours and 48 minutes of spacewalk time under her belt. Today's was the first for Jessica Meir. She, of course, now has a seven hours and 17 minutes total for today's spacewalk. That's exactly how long it lasted, seven hours and 17 minutes. And uh, with today's spacewalk, there has now been spent uh, in those 221 spacewalks from the Ford Space Station, 57 days, 20 hours and 29 minutes worth of spacewalking time. Again, that's 57 days, 20 hours and 29 minutes of spacewalking time just for space station assembly and maintenance. In all, there have been 420 spacewalks to date by all countries for hey, from all vehicles. That your glove heaters are off. EV1, glove heaters off. EV2 off. Hey, copy. And check gloves for contamination. And Christina, we're aware that uh, one of your glove gauntlets has something on it, and we're going to have uh, PPE, PPE on our end when we open the hatch. Copy. And Jessica, your gloves are good to go? Mine are good. I don't see any contamination. Hey, copy. Take your O2 actuator to IV. Can work. EV1 is an IV. EV2 is an IV. Copy EV1, EV2 are in IV. All right, we're going to resume the repress. Happy, thanks. Drew, I guess I do have on my left glove and a, a couple spots, a couple spots on my left and right glove of the same kind of gray substance that looks like that Christina had, but mine is isolated to just a tiny few small specks, whereas hers was kind of her whole a lot big area on her gauntlet. Okay, copy Jessica, and we'll uh, check in with Houston. And if you guys are okay with the raid, I'll throttle all the way up to Norm. I am okay with it. Me too. We've still got a few more uh, historical firsts to to commemorate before we're done for the day. So we're going to show you no, one another one another one of those uh, NASA first videos. This one marking uh, achievements by Peggy Whitson.
seeing a view from uh, inside the International Space Station where Andrew Morgan is waiting to welcome the spacewalkers back uh, into the equipment lock portion of the airlock. We'll see him wearing uh, some protective equipment. That is because of that smudge that Christina Cook noted on her uh, gauntlet of her glove. Just to make sure that that's nothing that could be hazardous to the crew, they'll they'll be ready to uh, to collect it and and uh, wearing a little bit of extra equipment as a precaution. Airlock pressure twelve. In there. Kind of see the same. Thirteen. Jessica, can you show me your gloves through the window? You see that little tiny spot right there? See that gray spot right here? It's right, right here. Yes, I can see that. Yeah. And then there's a couple on this finger. That you see, those are just, you know, I probably wouldn't have even noticed it if, it, if I hadn't seen that the gray color on Christina's. Okay, copy. Thanks for showing us, Jess. Okay, hey, Jessica, Christina, our DPDT is uh, zero. We're going to get ready to open the hatch, but we're, we're going to put our PPE on now. Copy. Copy. Again, the crew t members uh, on this side of the hatch taking some extra precautions just because of the smudge that Christina Cook noted on her uh, the gauntlet of her glove on her spacesuit. Uh, no, the crew didn't think that that was likely to be anything more than a smudge, but just in case, we always like to be prepared at NASA. Crew is here getting uh, some extra protective equipment on just in case it's hazardous material, and then they'll be uh, collecting her glove and making sure they get it uh, bagged so that they can take a closer look at that. I see the hatches open, Christina. 
happy. I can't see it, so thank you. <laughs> Congratulations. Let me get this waist tether off here. <laughs> so you can see that uh, hatch open. Jessica Muir waiting to come in. Following their seven hour and 17 minute long spacewalk today. They've got me out, so they're working on getting me into the Eda. We are still looking out for all the well wishes and cheers from the ground for the spacewalkers today. We got this one from Slater Robotics. Uh, they had a watch party for girls in the fourth and fifth grade there for Mrs. Thomas Robotics II class. So shout out to them. And they are wishing Christina Cook and Jessica Mir luck and uh, cheering them on as they make history. Should I pick up my, my mini workstation to get me around this, or am I good? Here. Okay, yep, holding position. Andrew Morgan and Luca Parmitano getting uh, Jessica Muir back into the rack that the spacesuit will be attached to as uh, they begin taking off the helmet and gloves and other items. Uh, Christina Cook waiting in the airlock for her turn so they can take off the uh, safer, the simplified aid for EVA or spacewalk rescue that needs to be removed before they can plug into that rack. get a good look here of how small that uh, crew lock portion is, all the equipment and, of course, the bulky spacesuits that have to fit into it before the uh, crew members can get outside. Airlock Houston on Space to Ground 1. The uh, EV crew is no longer hot mic'd. And no response required. Copy the thumbs up with the gloves.
Eastern Station, Luca on one. Go ahead, Luca. Yeah, that's why I, uh, I don't know if you guys heard this, but uh, Christina is suggesting that what most likely happened is that she got some uh, lube on a glove from the, um, the from the arm. Uh, Lee lube. Copy. Thanks for those words. And we still need to press with uh, the PPE as planned, just in case. Of course, we were we had no doubts about it. With this view of the uh, spacesuits, now is a good time to talk about the new spacesuits that NASA unveiled earlier this week that uh, will be the ones we're using as we return to the moon. We'll give a quick intro video of that, and then we have Kevin Wells, who's the spacesuit branch chief here at Johnson Space Center, to talk a little bit more about it. Uh, NASA unveiled earlier this week, and uh, we have here with us in the Mission Control Center, Kevin Wells, who's the Space Suit Branch Chief here at Johnson Space Center. Thanks so much for joining us, Kevin. It's good to be here. So looking at these spacesuits, can you tell us a little bit about how they'll be different from, from the new ones or how they are different from the new ones? Well, the first thing to note is there are two different spacesuits. And so while what we've been watching today is the use of an EVA or spacewalk spacesuit, um, which one of these new suits is, it's called XEMU. The orange suit that we saw in the video is actually a launch, entry, and abort um, spacesuit. So it's used for crew survival during launches and entries. And if there were something to go wrong uh, during the, it gives the crew survival capability until they can be rescued. But um, since we were talking EVAs today, um, and we, we got to see this exciting um, historic EVA today, we'll talk a little bit more about the XEMU, which is the next generation um, spacesuit for spacewalks. So the biggest change is going to be that um, the suit, the XEMU is designed for walking on a planetary surface. 
So um, the current spacesuit, we actually enter, and you'll be able to see potentially here um, before too long the crew uh, ingresses and egresses the suit or dons and doffs the suit, um, gets into and out of the suit via the waist. We take the pants off and you put it on like you do a shirt. The new spacesuit, we actually remove the or, or open the backpack like a hatch and the the, the um, what you saw in the video was, was Christine Davis, one of our suit engineers, getting into the suit from the rear. That's uh, a lot less likely to, cro to cause injuries. It's a lot easier to size the suits when you design it that way. So that rear entry is a big change. The walking lower torso, the, the walking legs on the suit is another big change. And then we have some life support technologies that are going to be different as well. Right. So these spacesuits that we're seeing, they're 30 more more than 30 years old? 40. 40 years yes. old. Yes, 40 plus years. So That's technology right. has come a long way since then. It has, it has. So there's some of the basic technology is actually similar. Um, some of the fabrics that we used then, we're using perhaps newer versions of them, but a lot of the fabrics are the same. Um, the bladder material is a urethane coated nylon. It's a very good bladder material, so we're not changing that. But um, especially a lot of the electronics, um, a lot of the cameras and the informatics in the suit, those all are, um, are new technologies that we're going to be employing in the XEMU. So as you, as we were, as we're watching this, um, we'll see them, as you mentioned, kind of come out of it like you would have shirt if your shirt was held in place. Um, uh, not exactly a comfortable maneuver to make. Uh, it's not. But, uh, but the new suit will be a lot easier to get on and also I think to get on without quite as much help as they have here, right? That's that's potentially true, yes. So we, especially when we're on the surface of the moon, there's only going to be two crew members, and they both have to get into and out of their suits. Um, so it will be um, somewhat easier, I think, for them to to go through that process of putting the suit on, getting into it, and then also in getting out of it. Is there anything that you would say you're most proud of on, on the advances that, that have been made in the new suit or anything to, that just really excites you? Well, I think the um, there's been a lot of work over the past 15 years or so in getting the mobility of that lower torso to really work well. Um, it's it's kind of a tricky problem when you put big bearing rings around your legs, but you still want them to work like legs. Um, and and the same thing with your shoulders and and your arms. So that's a that's a huge advancement. The other thing is in the life support system, um, we're going to be using a completely new technology for cooling the suit. Um, it's been something it's something that's been developed here at Johnson Space Center, um, and it's a really exciting new technology. And I want to ask also, you know, a lot of things we've been talking a lot about with the spacesuits lately is size. So the, the new spacesuit, uh, we, we went through a, a number of the different ways that this is size as the crew members were getting ready to go out, but the new spacesuit will have an even bigger range of size, right? And interestingly, we were, we were able to achieve that with actually fewer um, components okay. than the EMU employs. The EMU was originally designed to fit a you know the same kind of range that we're going to be able to fit with the XEMU, but due to a number of factors, NASA decided a very long time ago that they would only build the three largest sizes of the hard upper torso. And that really limited who we could fit in the EMU. But with the XEMU, because of that rear entry, we're actually able to move the shoulder joints closer inward. Um, and that allows us to improve the range of sizes of people that we fit with only two different hard upper torso sizes. And then the rest of the components of the suit have many different sizes so that, you know, people come in all shapes and sizes. And so it really does allow us to fit a large breadth of the population. I'm sure that will be uh, appreciated by aspiring astronauts. Um, and you have already started testing these suits with, with astronauts. They've tried it on. What kind of feedback have you gotten? Well, so far it's been very positive. Um, so we've had uh, four different uh, NBL, Neutral Buoyancy Lab, that's the big pool. We've tested it four times in, in our four different test series in, that, in the pool. We've also done a number of, um, of ground 
uh, tests, both with weight relief systems and without, um, where crew members are walking around in the new suit. And they, they agree that we seem to be meeting the mark in terms of mobility, um, in terms of comfort, and in terms of fit. So That's good news. I'm sure you're glad to hear that. We are. We're, we're excited about the feedback. Well, and having unveiled them, what, what's the next step for you guys? So we're still in the design and development phase. So what we what we have shown you is is our is our latest prototype. But we recently had our preliminary design review. Um, so we we had a bunch of experts from around the country sit with us and look over the design, and they're giving us feedback now. We're going to incorporate that feedback, and we're building our next version of test suits. So we'll evaluate those and do one more iteration on the design before our critical design review and then with after that critical design review we'll do our our certification units where we'll actually test them for in flight like conditions and at, then certify the design and build our flight units sounds like you've got a lot of work ahead of you do you think we can meet the the deadline we've set 2024 it's going to be a challenge but we're up to it all right well thank you so much for coming and talking with us we really appreciate it we can't wait to see more of those new spacesuits they're going to be tested eventually on the space station that's right we're so, going to send one up uh, in 2023 so, All yep. right. So we will we will be watching for that for sure. Thanks again, and and we'll be we'll be like I said, looking for for more news on the new spacesuits. Thanks, Brandy. It's exciting to talk about. Seeing Andrew Morgan and uh, Luca Parmitano backing up that glove of Christina Cooks that had the smudge on it that they are just taking some extra precautions for. Crew didn't think that there was anything, any reason to think there was more, that, that was more than a stain, but uh, we do also always want to be extra careful and not uh, expose the crew members to anything that could be hazardous. And since we don't know exactly what that smudge was from, the safest route is to go ahead and treat it as though it could be hazardous. So they are, as you see, wearing uh, some extra protective equipment and bagging that glove up so that if, if the material did happen to be hazardous, it wouldn't uh, get in anybody's eyes or be breathed in by any of the crew members.
Still watching the crew members get out of their spacesuits, and uh, that brings up another Ask NASA question that we received. This one from uh, Ms. Peria's eighth grade ELA and social studies class in California asking how long does it take to get out of their spacesuits? Uh, that can vary a little bit, but the, uh, the procedure that they walk through calls for it to take about 20 minutes. So as you can see, it's already, I think, probably taken a little longer than that this time because of that extra precaution with the smudge on Christina Cook's glove. But in general, it takes about 20 minutes. And uh, obviously the gloves come off first and then we should be seeing the helmets come off soon after that. We also have a question uh, from Guman who's asking, do the crew members have water bags in their helmets that they can uh, use to get, uh, get sips of water during the spacewalk? And yes, they do. They, that is actually the one, if you can call it a luxury, luxury that they have during uh, spacewalks. They don't get to stop for bathroom breaks or to get a snack, but they do have a, a water bag that they can, uh, they have a straw that goes near their mouth and they can get a sip when they need one. Mark. Hey, to help uh, with pr reduce the amount of time we've got the depressurized suit with the fan still on, once you're done with dealing with the uh, PP and glove situation, we'd like you to get through at least from step 30 through through at least step 38 for Christina, and then you can start going back to uh, Jessica. Jessica's in a good suit config right now. Okay, copy. So 30 through th uh, 38 r right now. We're, we're at that point now where we're, uh, I'll pick up in 30. Thanks. Steps of the procedure that were just called up there, uh, getting uh, Christina Cook through step 38 of her suit doffing procedure that will get her through the point where she has her helmet off and it looks like Andrew Morgan's getting that in work right now and then he will begin helping uh, Jessica Mir get out of her spacesuit as well. And there is uh, Christina Cook, our first spacewalker to, to be seen outside of that helmet since uh, the spacewalk began early this morning. Again, they have completed a seven hour and 17 minute spacewalk. This was Christina's fourth. So that brings her to a total of 27 hours and 48 minutes spent spacewalking. Continuing with our Ask NASA questions, we uh, have one next from Jeremy who wants to know what is the maximum amount of time astronauts can safely stay outside the space station with the current PLIS, and that stands for uh, 
portable life support system. That's the backpack that allows them to basically have their own personal spacesuit to do a spacewalk in. Um, right now we plan most spacewalks for six and a half hours. Uh, that is actually based on how long the spacewalks, uh, the spacewalk training in the neutral buoyancy laboratory can last. Uh, they have a limit of six and a half hours there and you want to train the same way that you actually do the spacewalks. So we plan the spacewalks for six and a half hours as well. But as you can see, they're not limited to six and a half hours since we went seven hours and 17 minutes today. And actually the longest spacewalk lasted eight hours and 56 minutes. That was in 2001, uh, March 11th, 2001 on the STS-102 mission. And uh, we had a female spacewalker that participated in it, Susan Helms. She went out with Jim Voss on that spacewalk back in 2001. Had a brief uh, handover where we uh, lost video for a second from the space station. And in the meantime, Jessica Muir got her helmet off. We now see both of today's spacewalkers who completed this historic spacewalk, the first that uh, was done by two women. It's Jessica Muir on the uh, on the left side of the screen wearing an all white spacesuit and now uh, getting our first look at her since she had on her spacesuit space on this morning. Once again, we have been getting well wishes all along uh, the day as we worked through the task of the spacewalk. And we have one more to show you. This one came in from Twitter, and it's actually a video. Yeah. Christina. Yeah. Saturn's rocket. Saturn's station. And as a uh, inspiration there, a uh, future astronaut in the making, perhaps, who I'm sure watched along with today's spacewalk and saw Christina Cook uh, perform that spacewalk with Jessica Meir. Again, that lasted 17, uh, seven hours and 17 minutes. And we do have one more uh, first that we want to commemorate today. That is uh, the first female spacewalker, Catherine Sullivan.